morning, everyone. We're just giving about a minute or two uh, for let some other folks come in. Um, but welcome. Good morning. All righty, it's a few more seconds in case there's anyone still logging in. All right, well, I'm going to get started and hopefully if everyone uh, is here, that's great. As we get some folks joining, I'm sure they can follow along. Well, good morning, everyone. On behalf of Child360 and Early Edge California, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Perspectives from the ECE Field, Pandemic Experiences and Workforce Needs. It is particularly meaningful to discuss workforce issues today, which is a day in which we honor Cesar Chavez, who was a champion of workers. My name is Bill Sperling and I serve as Child360 CEO. For those of you who might not be familiar with our organization, Child360 is a nonprofit that supports the ECE workforce through a variety of different supports, including advocacy, coaching, training, professional advisement, and even placement services. Now, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, early care and education professionals, as we know, have cared for and educated thousands of California's youngest learners, enabling other essential workers to get back to work. And so many of California's early childhood professionals, the majority of whom are women of color, have put their health and the health of their families at risk on a daily basis. And now, more than two years into the pandemic, many ECE providers are still dealing with challenges such as increased cleaning and sanitation costs, increased regulations, reduced enrollments, as well as the interconnected issues of low wages and staffing shortages, which have plagued the sector even before the pandemic. In short, it's getting harder to do a job that was difficult before. In the research and remarks you'll hear today, you'll learn more about those challenges that the ECE professionals are facing and about the workforce related and financial support they need as we live in and eventually emerge from a COVID impacted world. Now to kick us off today, we'll hear from California State Senator Connie Leva, who's been a tremendous early learning champion uh, even before the pandemic and who represents the residents of Senate District 20. After that, we'll hear highlights from our new policy report to be provided by Child 360's Director of Public Policy, our own Elsa Jacobson, and Early Edge California's Director of Dual Language Learner Programs, Caroline Krilat. Following their presentation, we'll hear remarks from Aurora Porsche Reyes, She's a child care provider who, direct, who directs the Reyes Family Child Care right here in Los Angeles. Then we'll have a series of policy recommendations followed by a short Q&A and we'll hear from Early Edge California CEO, Patricia Lozano. We encourage you to stay with us for the entire webinar and please feel free to include your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, we may not be able to address all the questions today but we will do our best to respond to you individually following the webinar. Now, before I turn my uh, the time over to Senator Leva, I would like to introduce you to our interpreter, Anne Guzman, who will explain how to listen to the webinar in Spanish. Anne? Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Guzman, like I said, and I will be giving instructions on how to listen in Spanish. Bueno, hola a todos. Si prefieren escuchar este webinario en español, van a hacer clic en el símbolo que parece un mundo en la parte posterior de la pantalla y van a elegir español. Gracias. Gracias, Anne. Now, I'd like to turn the time over to Senator Leo. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you as the chair of Senate Education and the former chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus. I'm so excited that Child 360, Early Edge California, and many others of you work every single day to ensure that California's children have the strongest possible start so that they can achieve their fullest potential. 
after all, these are our future leaders. One of them might be our next senator. As I mentioned during last year's webinar, the Legislative Women's Caucus has fought for increased access to subsidized child care for over 20 years, way before I even came to the Senate. And for the last decade, the sole budget ask of the Women's Caucus has been related to child care and its many evolving needs, from increasing provider rates to increasing slots or to enhancing workforce development for ECE professionals. Now that it has been over two years since the COVID-19 pandemic began, so hard to believe, the world has finally begun to realize, as we all already knew, that childcare and ECE work is absolutely essential, especially if you are a working parent and especially if you are a working mom. Sadly, during the pandemic, many child care providers were forced to close, while others stayed open to serve families of essential workers across California. While I'm no longer the chair of the Women's Caucus, I remain so committed to these issues. Last year, I introduced the Child Care Stabilization Formula, SB 246, rate reform, which I had put on hold the previous year to focus on reversing the proposed 10% cut to provider rates. SB 246 sought to establish a single regionalized reimbursement rate system for child care, preschool, and early learning services. I've always believed that we needed re to restructure how we reimburse providers to allow them to keep their doors open and to serve more children. Provider rates must also be raised equitably across the board, regardless of the type or location of the provider. As I've said many times before, it is vital that we invest in childcare providers since without quality, affordable childcare, there will be no lasting recovery for any parents and especially for working moms. Um, no one will be able to go to work. So you can imagine how incredibly thrilled I was when over $2 billion one time and ongoing funds for childcare reimbursement rate reform were proposed in the Senate and were proposed and then passed in the budget last June. So much of SB 246 was put into this budget ask but sometimes the governor likes to put things in the budget so he can claim credit. That's fine. We just wanna make sure the right thing happens. So universal preschool, you may have heard that I recently introduced SB 976, which will establish universal preschool in California. Specifically, SB 976 will make sure that parents have the option to send their children to a public elementary school or community-based child care provider to benefit from universal preschool. This important bill will also help protect the stability of jobs for teachers as community-based providers, which employ, as we heard, primarily women and primarily women of color. If these facilities and to the community close, which will very likely happen if we cannot expand flexibility, many women will lose their jobs and families will have fewer options for their children. It is critical that Californians offer flexibility and options for working families, especially working families with children who would benefit from transitional kindergarten, but are not able to access those services because of their own day-to-day -day responsibilities. As working parents know, in order to make care options realistic, we need to allow for full day options and flexible hours, such as early drop-off, late pickup, weekend care or year round care. I remember when my girls were little and I remember how important all day preschool was so that I could go to work. So before concluding, I would just like to say thank you. Thank you for what you do every day. You are our true heroes and you really are helping raise our next generation. Let's keep working together to make sure that affordable and quality subsidized childcare is available across our great state. We must continue advocating for women, children, and families. Clearly, there's more work to do, but we must do what we can to ensure that there's increased access to affordable and quality subsidized childcare and early childhood education. I thank you all for having me, and thank you for the great work that you do. Well, thank you so much, Senator Leva, for being such a powerful advocate for DC professionals and for young children and their families and for consistently championing the issues of fair compensation and so many others for the ECE field. We're extremely grateful for your work and very appreciative that you joined us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Be well.
Well, with that, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Elsa Jacobson, and I serve as the Director of Public Policy at Child360, and I'll be sharing some of the highlights of our ECE report with you today. Um, if we could please bring up the PowerPoint presentation. So we at Child360 in Early Edge, California conducted research to better understand the pandemic experiences and workforce needs of Los Angeles County ECE professionals. We developed an online survey that was administered to providers and teachers working in ECE programs throughout LA County for whom Child360 and the Child Care Alliance of Los Angeles are providing quality improvement services. We also surveyed a cadre of ECE professionals in Pomona Unified who are not receiving these services. Next slide, please. 618 ECE professionals completed the survey in November, and 86% were providers and 14% were teachers. Over 82% of respondents were people of color. Next slide, please. Just over 40% of respondents worked at a family child care home, and we were really pleased to have been able to reach so many FCC professionals whose perspectives are not always reflected in research. The remaining 58% of respondents worked at centers, from those affiliated with school districts to community-based organizations, private centers, and programs at community colleges or four-year universities. As you can see from the slide, the vast majority of respondents served preschoolers, nearly 70% served toddlers, over 50% served infants, and just over 40% served school-age children, and over 30% of respondents served all four age groups. After the online survey was completed, we also held two small focus groups, one with eight providers and another with seven lead teachers in order to further explore the key issues addressed in the survey. Next slide. As you've heard already from our speakers, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating financial impact on the ECE sector. Many ECE providers have experienced significant drops in enrollment and incurred increased costs related to cleaning and sanitation, personnel, distance learning, and facilities modifications needed to meet health and safety guidelines. These financial pressures have been particularly damaging given that many ECE programs already operate on razor thin margins. When providers answered a question about their program's revenue, 51% reported that there was a gap between the total monthly cost of running their programs and the amount of revenue or reimbursement they received. In addition of the providers reporting a funding gap, nearly half reported a monthly gap of between roughly $3,000 and $10,000, and just over a quarter were reported a monthly gap of under $3,000. Next slide, please. 72% of providers reported that they were operating below capacity. When asked why they were operating at reduced capacity, providers most frequently reported that they did not have enough families enrolling in their programs to reach full capacity. In addition, some providers indicated that they were choosing not to reach maximum enrollment because they were concerned about health risks associated with COVID-19, they did not have sufficient staff to operate their programs at full enrollment, and or they had insufficient space to operate at maximum capacity and still keep children socially distanced. Ultimately, decreased enrollment has made it challenging for some ECE programs to cover their expenses. Now, it is noteworthy that the state has implemented a hold harmless provision that has aided some providers. For example, it enables providers who contract directly with the state um, to be reimbursed at 100% of their contract maximum reimbursable amount or their expenses, whichever is less. However, this provision only applies to costs associated with serving children who receive state subsidized care. So when a provider experiences a drop in enrollment of children who are not receiving subsidized care, state subsidized care, the provision doesn't provide financial relief for this revenue loss. Next slide, please. This slide shows the costs that providers indicated they were most worried about being able to cover. Toys and outdoor equipment and personnel costs for current staff were at the top of the list. And I should note that in some cases, providers have needed to hire additional staff to assist with cleaning and sanitizing and to ensure that low adult child ratios and small stable groups of adults and children are maintained. Next slide, please. The 2021-2022 state budget included relief funding for ECE programs and families, as well as ECE expansion funding. This funding was much needed. 
As you can see on the slide, the budget included reimbursement rate increases for many providers. Providers most frequently indicated that they would use additional funding from these increased reimbursement rates to raise staff wages and to purchase classroom materials. It is important to note, however, that these new rates are based on an outdated market rate survey from 2018, and they're not keeping pace with inflation. In addition, while voucher-based providers in Los Angeles County saw their rates increase, many voucher-based providers, particularly centers in rural counties, did not. So these rate increases were very important. However, until the rates reflect the true cost of providing ECE services, it will be difficult for ECE professionals who are largely women of color to be paid an equitable wage and to receive the health benefits and retirement security that they deserve. The state budget also included funding for several types of provider stipends to help programs in meeting challenges caused by the pandemic. When providers were asked if they were aware of one-time stipends that paid $600 per subsidized child, 71% responded affirmatively. In addition, 18% responded that they were actually unaware of the stipends, and 11% indicated that they did not operate a state subsidized program. Providers who received the stipends most frequently indicated that they would use the dollars for PPE and or cleaning supplies and for employee salaries. The state budget also included $250 million for a new grant program that will fund the construction, renovation, and repair of ECE facilities. Surprisingly, 80% of providers indicated that they were unaware of this new grant funding prior to taking the survey. Family child care providers and independent private center-based programs were least likely to know about the funding. However, after being informed about this new grant funding, over 41% of providers indicated that they would apply for it, over 40% indicated that they were unsure, and over 17% indicated that they would not apply for the funding. Next slide, please. The state budget also waived fees for families receiving subsidized child care and development services for fiscal year 2021-22. When providers were asked how the fee waiver policy had impacted their programs, 36% indicated that families in their programs had been able to keep their children enrolled because they did not have the burden of paying family fees. The state budget also included a commitment to expand child care access by adding 120,000 child care slots in fiscal year 2021-22, growing to 200,000 new slots by fiscal year 2025-26, should the state's economic conditions support this increase. 62% of providers indicated that they would apply for new general child care and development funding. And I should note that general child care and development, the, the, the general child care and development program is one of the state programs that subsidizes child care spaces. And the most common reasons given for not, intended, not intending to apply for slot funding were one, inadequate physical space, so those infrastructure grants can certainly come in handy, and two, due to a staff shortage, inability to serve additional children and still maintain required child staff ratios. Next slide, please. Our survey showed that ECE programs are facing significant staffing challenges. And as our CEO mentioned earlier, this is not new, but it's a challenge that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. 51% of providers reported that they were not able to fill all staff positions at their programs with qualified individuals. In addition, when we asked providers to identify the most significant challenges their programs were facing, these staffing challenges came up again. They most frequently reported difficulty finding qualified substitute teachers and difficulty finding qualified preschool teachers, as well as difficulty in keeping children socially distanced and or wearing masks. When we asked providers why they thought they were having difficulty recruiting teachers and substitutes, not surprisingly, they most frequently pointed to low compensation in the field. Another frequently given response was that qualified candidates weren't applying for positions because of the risk of exposure to COVID-19. Next slide, please. We also asked teachers about the most difficult challenges that they specifically are facing. And they most frequently reported worry about being exposed to or infected with the COVID-19 virus, followed by insufficient compensation. They also pointed to the challenge of managing COVID-related health situations. For example, when a child or family member becomes ill or is exposed to COVID and other children in the program must quarantine, or uncertainty regarding the correct health protocols to follow for different symptoms exhibited among children. They also reported a sense of burnout and mental health challenges due to stress associated with the pandemic. 
Next slide, please. We wanted to know what would make teachers jobs more manageable in these very challenging circumstances and teachers most frequently pointed to the need for higher compensation. As one teacher in our focus group put it, quote, compensation has been an issue for years. The push to go and get our bachelors, go and get credentials, go get our masters. We've done it with the promise of the salary is going to catch up. It's been years and the salary hasn't caught up. I think that's why you're seeing the exit of so many early childhood educators saying, I can't afford to wait anymore for it to catch up. Teachers also frequently cited the need for more support in working with children with special needs. And focus group participants said that they're seeing more children with developmental delays, and there are just simply not enough support services to meet this need. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we also asked ECE professionals what workforce supports would be most helpful to them. And overall, providers were most interested in receiving paid professional development that took place outside of work hours. And this was followed by a desire for stipends to enroll in higher education courses. As you can see from the slide, teachers were also most interested in receiving paid professional development, but their preference was slightly higher for training that took place during traditional work hours. Teachers also expressed a strong preference for stipends. Next slide, please. We also asked respondents what academic or career goals they'd like to pursue. And interestingly, learning an additional language to better communicate with the children and families in their programs was the most frequently selected option by both providers and teachers. And I think this really speaks to the linguistic diversity of families in Los Angeles County. In addition, earning a bachelor's degree was the second most frequently selected goal by teachers and engaging in policy or advocacy work related to ECE was the second most frequently cited goal by providers. Next slide, please. We also asked respondents on what professional development topics they were most interested in receiving training. And we left the question open-ended so that respondents could write in their training topics of choice. As you can see from the slide, overall teachers who are represented in light blue were most interested in topics related to supporting diverse children and instructional support, while providers demonstrated much more interest in topics related to business and professional growth. Next slide, please. And here you can see the specific professional development topics in which respondents were most interested. For providers, there was greatest interest in professional development related to managing and mentoring staff. And for teachers, there was a marked interest in professional development on challenging behaviors or behavior management. On this same note, 37% of survey respondents expressed concern that children are exhibiting challenging behaviors due to trauma. And it's important that training on behavior management be offered with a trauma-informed lens. Now my colleague, Carolyn Krulat, will share several additional research findings with us. Carolyn? Thank you, Elsa, and good morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn Krulat, Director of Dual Language Learner Programs with Early Edge California. Thank you so much for joining us. Next slide, please. So we, were, we asked survey respondents what the key indicators of quality in preschool and infant and toddler programs should be. And they were able to check up to six indicators from a list that we provided to them. And respondents most frequently indicated a safe and stimulating environment for children as a key indicator for both types of programs. And respondents also identified the same eight indicators as the most critical for both types of programs, which you can see here on the slide. Next slide, please. In California, nearly 60% of children ages five and younger live in a home where a language other than English is spoken. And these children are known as dual language learners. Nearly three quarters of survey respondents reported serving DLLs. And it's also no noteworthy that respondents identified 22 different languages spoken by the children in their programs, which really speaks to the di diversity of our state. And nine 95% of respondents indicated that children in their program spoke English, 78% reported that children in their program spoke Spanish, and 14% indicated that children um, spoke Mandarin. And these were the languages that respondents most frequently indicated that children in their program were speaking. And we also wanted to share a little around our findings around dual language programs, which are those in which children are taught literacy and content in two languages, English and another language. 
44% of survey respondents reported serving children in a dual language program, and just over 87% of those respondents reported that the non-English language of instruction was Spanish. We also asked respondents who did not provide a dual language program if they would like to do so in the future, and 58% answered in the affirmative. And family child care providers and providers who worked at district-based programs expressed the greatest interest in providing these programs. Next slide, please. So providers who expressed interest in offering a dual language program in the future were asked to identify barriers in doing this. And they most frequently cited a lack of training on effective dual language program practices. Also, a teacher in one of our focus groups said that she would need guidance on program requirements, including staff qualifications, in order to offer a dual language program. And another teacher suggested that bilingual educators who can provide ECE services in a second language should receive additional compensation for utilizing the skill. And we could not agree more. Next slide, please. We also asked respondents about the needs of families in their programs, and 82% of providers indicated that the majority of families in the program needed full-time care. And when providers were asked what services had been most requested by families in their program over the last three months, they most frequently cited preschool services and toddler care. Next slide, please. And finally, we asked respondents what they felt were the most prevalent challenges that families were facing. And nearly 70% identified stress as a prevalent challenge. Nearly 60% identified financial insecurity as a prevalent challenge. And as you can see, many of the challenges identified on this slide are related and they indicate that challenges caused by and exacerbated by the pandemic continue. So next, we'll be pleased to hear from one of our providers who par participated in our focus groups, Aurora Reyes, who's the director of Reyes Family Child Care in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for joining us, Aurora. Thank you guys for having me. I'm pleased to be here. Um, good morning. My name is Aurora Portia Reyes. The children and their families affectionately call me Miss Portia in my program. I'm the director of Reyes Family Child Care in, in the Lamert Park community of Los Angeles. I've been working in the field of ECE for 24 years, and I've been a family child care provider for 15 and a half years. This past August, I also earned my master's in human development. I'm sure you guys hear some of the kids in the background. I'm sorry about that. Um, I currently serve 10 children from the ages of 13 months to five years old, as well as one school-age child, and the families come from Long Beach, Compton, and, and, other, and several other areas. Most of the children are with me between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., but some come earlier and some have stayed as late as 10 p.m. when their parents are working late. I'm grateful to have been able to keep my site open during the pandemic and to help children and parents maintain a sense of consistency and normalcy. Asha, close my door. <laughs> Sorry. When the pandemic began in 2020, I closed my site for a month because families were sheltering in place, but I soon reopened to serve children of essential workers. We've made major efforts to keep the environment safe and healthy for children and staff, such as I've installed um, air purifiers. We're constantly cleaning and sanitizing. We, re we request that the children wear masks and are constantly washing their hands, showing them the proper hand washing techniques. Um, it's been expensive and it's time consuming to keep this level of cleaning and sanitation up. And it's been, been very stressful when some of the children have contracted COVID. This past January, I've closed my program again temporarily when two children came down with COVID-19 and I had to spend $600 to disinfect and clean my site. It continues to be costly to do all the cleaning and sanitizing that is necessary. Early in the pandemic, when we were serving school-age children during the day, I had to ensure that I could provide Wi-Fi access so they can complete their assignments. It was challenging to do, to ensure that children of different ages stay physically distant. 
and that the little ones didn't make too much noise while the older children were studying or on their Zoom. While I haven't been able to take children on field trips during the pandemic, we go on regular nature walks and I make sure that every day is filled with activities to help children develop critical sensory, social, emotional, and language skills. I'm passionate about what I do and I try to make sure that learning is fun for the children. I feed off their interest when helping them develop literacy and numer numeracy skills. And I help children prepare for kindergarten and beyond for the rest of their life. The pandemic has shined light on how essential ECE professionals are, but the compensation does not reflect this. After taking into account all of the expenses, the payroll, the utilities, workers' compensation, child care insurance, high-speed Wi-Fi costs, cleaning supplies and food, I make below minimum wage. You can work at a fast food restaurant or at Target and make better a better income, and that's not right. I rely heavily on my assistants, and I need to be able to pay them with their work. I would also like to be able to provide my staff with the benefits that larger organizations offer. Throughout the pandemic, I've received several stipends from the state that have helped me to pay for cleaning costs, PPE, cleaning supplies, staff, and to ensure adequate safety and supervision for my program. While these stipends have been very, very, very helpful, they've provided temporary, temporary relief. And the, program, and the problem of compensation for ECE professionals must be adequately addressed. I would also like to receive professional development on key business practices like developing employee handbooks and staff onboarding. I'm a small business owner as well as an educator, and I'm always looking to improve my practice. I also know that my staff would like to receive professional development on behavior management with the trauma-informed lens. It's important to help children learn to express their feelings and emotions, and for us as educators to be sensitive to what might be taking place in their home or the outside environment. I love what I do, and I call on the state legislators to make the investments necessary to support us in our essential work. Thank you, thank you guys for having me, and I'm honored to be here. Well, thank you, Aurora. Um, and I will say, we know how much you're juggling and we're so <laughs> grateful that you took the time to be here. And just for, thank you for being a voice for so many EC providers and for giving us a little window into your excellent program. I, I've had an opportunity at least to see some video of your program and I know how excellent it is. And thank you also for highlighting for us, for state legislators, you know, for our audience, um, some of the key challenges that you and some of your fellow ECE professionals are facing. We're really grateful that you joined us today. So thank you. Thank you. So now we'd like to move on to sharing just a few recommendations from our report. So let's bring up the slide presentation again. Thank you. So, Based on the findings from our survey and focus groups, we're recommending the following investments and practices to better support ECE professionals and the families they serve. First, I think it's no surprise that our first recommendation is to increase provider reimbursement rates to a level that enables providers to pay themselves and their staff a fair wage and better cover the costs of running their programs. In addition, fund stipends for higher education coursework and paid professional development for early educators in all ECE settings. I would also note it's important to ensure that funding is sufficient for programs to provide substitutes if needed when ECE professionals are attending trainings or courses. In addition, fund the development of trainings on the topics listed on the slide if these trainings are not available in sufficient numbers. And I should note that the topics on the slide were the ones most frequently requested by survey respondents. Next slide, please. Next 
So additional needs are funding more professional development training for early educators on working with dual language learners, as well as outreach strategies to recruit more current and aspiring bilingual educators to work with dual language learners, as well as funding more professional development training on working with children with special needs, as well as specialists who can work with ECE professionals to provide critical early intervention services to children in their programs. And finally, expand outreach efforts to ECE professionals regarding new grant programs or other funding opportunities. And policymakers might also consider, consider setting aside funding for outreach and new grant programs, as this would enable the California Department of Social Services to expand its outreach efforts to ECE professionals and to partner with state associations and our local agencies to inform hard to reach populations like li license exempt providers and family child care homes about new funding. So that concludes our presentation. We saw that a few questions came up during our presentation and Elsa and I will be able to answer a few of them now. Um, we saw there was one about the total number of respondents to the survey and that was 618. Um, and please feel free to add a couple more questions um, if you would like. Um, in terms of, is there a community breakdown of where respondents were from? So these are from LA County, um, but we can follow up and share additional information from the different regions of LA County. Um, and thank you for joining us, Marlene. Great to see you. And Elsa, um, would you like to answer one of the questions? Yes, and I believe this was a question from Marlene. She asked what language was the, the survey offered in, um, it was, well, it was in two languages. It was offered in English and in Spanish. Um, another question was, were the family child care providers who responded to the survey licensed? And yes, they were. All of the providers um, who responded to the survey were, they came from licensed sites and the teachers who responded to the survey worked at sites that were licensed by the state. Um, there's a question about what the average age is of FCC providers. Unfortunately, we don't have that information because we, we didn't ask uh, respondents age. Um, there's also a question about how our recommendations will be shared with state legislators. So we'll be releasing our report shortly and sharing um, with, with legislators um, and also key, key members of the governor's office and then also including the key points from our report in different meetings that, that we have. Yes, and I would also note that we're not just sharing this report with state legislators and their staff. We're, we're also going to be sharing the report with elected officials at the local level and with members of Congress and their staff. We, we think this is really important and we have a very good sample size. I mean, over 600 ECE professionals um, is a great sample size and really speaks to the needs of Los Angeles County. Um, and another question came in about the geographic areas. Again, um, this report is specific to Los Angeles County. Okay, and I think those were all the questions. Yes, thank you so much for your questions. Um, we'll now turn it over to Patricia Lozano, Executive Director for Early Edge California, who will share some, some closing remarks. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Elsa, and uh, thank you to our, our participants for your great questions. Um, as we heard from the data and from all, um, you know, the, the panelists, um, our providers are doing so much work and they need, they need more supports. Um, as Senator Leva mentioned, the world finally realized that childcare and early learning are essential and that we need to invest more in the systems to support working parents, especially women. Thank you, Aurora, for all the work you do. So inspiring. Um, thank you for being such a great advocate. And yes, we will continue to share this message of um, the need for higher compensation and more training opportunities. Um, you know, we also saw from the data that our teachers and providers serve a very diverse population of children and they, that they need to support them and they need more training on how to work with dual language learners and they need resources. So we'll, we'll share that message again. Um, as Carolyn mentioned and Elsa too, we'll be sharing the report and the recording uh, with all the participants and it's, it, it would also be available on our website, Early Edge website and um, the Child360 website. 
Also, if you have questions, please contact Elsa and, and Carolyn um, and um, feel free to send us additional questions um, if you have. So there are the emails are right there. Um, and then, you know, thank you again, Senator um, Connie Leva and Aurora Porsche for joining us and for sharing um, your time with us. Um, and we'll, you know, we, we really share um, your, your concerns and we'll continue to share with others so we can um, change the policies and get, get a better supports for providers and teachers in California. I also want to thank uh, the Child360 and Early Edge teams for, for gathering this critical data um, that will help us to, to really make a case for, for our teachers and providers. Uh, special thanks to all the 600 teachers and providers who participated in the survey and the focus groups to help us understand really the needs of those who um, take care and teach our children. Uh, to you and all the participants, we hope that this report will be valuable um, and that you, you know, appreciate it and, and learn today. Uh, and please, please share this with your networks. We need uh, the more people um, that we engage, the better. Uh, thank you all and we'll see you soon.